Here are all three electrolytics laid out with the capacitors I'm going to be putting inside of them. All Nichicons, that's my favorite type of capacitor to use. I like them especially because instead of being short and fat they're long and skinny. So I can get them inside here, no problem. Also rated for long life and 105 degrees Celsius. So no problem with the heat inside of a TV set. So this one was originally marked as let's see here, uh, 60 microfarad at 400 volts and two sections of 20 microfarad at 350 volts. I have selected a 68 at 450 and two 22s at 400. I like to give myself an overhead of at least 50 volts whenever possible and going a little bit higher in capacitance is fine so 22 instead of 20 or 68 instead of 60 is no problem however I would not go overboard with that like uh, especially on the power supply filter for example if it was rated for 60 and I put in a 220 and that was the first filter cap that's a bad idea because that's going to put a big surge when the set turns on and that 5U4 rectifier warms up because this a discharge capacitor is quite a heavy load and rectifier tubes are only rated for so much surge current so something to be careful about and you certainly don't want to go too low because then you'll get ripple, uh, some ripple in your power supply and various other circuits this guy, uh, 20 at 450, 80 at 350, and 100 at 50. So, I got an 80 at 400, and I got a 22 at 450. So here's where you run into trouble though. Typically, the largest you can get for electrolytics is 450. And so I'm right at the edge. This was rated 450. I'm using 450. You can get 500 and 600 volt caps, but uh, only one or two makers make them, and they usually cost a bit more. And you're not going to find them in the small, skinny package. I know Just Radios has some, but they are the Axials, I believe. I think I've got some around here. I'll show you what they look like. Yeah, here we go. This is a 10 microfarad capacitor rated for 500 volts. Whereas this is 10 microfarad rated for 450 volts. You can see how much smaller that is. Also this has radio leads so when I restuff the capacitor with this I can just put it down here and stick the leads right out the bottom no problem. With one of these you'll have to bend a lead around and then probably splice in an extender to fit it out the bottom. And yeah, they're physically a bit larger. Also only rated for 85 degrees Celsius. Not really a big deal. I mean, the set's not going to get that hot. 100 degrees Celsius is the boiling point of water. But I like to use the highest rated caps I can get. Just uh, so they last as long as possible. There are also some capacitors made by Sprague. Sprague Atoms. Getting harder and harder to find and they're quite expensive, but uh, by all accounts they are the best capacitors you can get. So if you've got the money and you can find them, by all means use them. So as you can see, these will fit inside here with no problem. Next step I have to do is get rid of these old nasty insides. One technique I've used in the past is to cut this bit of tape here and just unroll the whole thing. Certainly works, no problem, but there's another way to do it that's a little bit quicker, quicker and less messy. Okay, so a quick and dirty way to get the insides out of the base, which I want to reuse, is to kind of get in there so you get a little gap in there and then clip these off. This, these insides are a bit mushy so you can kind of bend this down a little bit. 
the point you start working the tool in there. Alright, there's one. Once you get one, you can bend it up even more. Just one left. There we go. This is tossing the trash. Here's what we're left with. A little bit of residue on there. I'll spray on some multi-purpose disinfecting cleaner. Let it, let it dry out thoroughly. And then I will drill some small holes to feed the new capacitor leads through. I finished rebuilding all three capacitors. You can see how much smaller these modern ones are. For this one though, I did have to double stack them. Just a little bit too big to fit side by side. So what I did was spliced on a bit of wire here. When you do structures like this, it's a little bit floppy. So what I like to do is secure with a bit of hot glue. I've already done this one. And I'll squirt a little on this guy. Just to help stabilize everything. I slid the new caps inside the cans and recrimped them. Now I'm going to reinstall them and hook all the wires back up and hopefully won't make any mistakes. And then we can try powering this up back up. Alright, I've got all three electrolytics reinstalled and rewired. And I've finished recapping almost the entire set. Still a few wax paper caps up here in the IF section. But all the critical stuff has been replaced and or tested. So I want to go ahead and try to power this set up now. I'm going to get it on my Variac and hook up a volt meter to the output of the 5U4, which I will reinstall. And well, let's see if we can get some life out of this set. Okay, I've hooked the speaker up. I've got the set plugged into my Variac, which is fused, which will offer protection if there's a short. I've got my meter hooked up to B+, which should be oh, around 320 volts or so. I've double checked my wiring. So here goes. That's good. Shot up to about 400 and as the tubes warm up, this should drop down. There you go, son. We had sound, <laughs> very briefly. I do have a turn to channel 6 and I've got an antenna hooked up. Voltage is holding steady, that's good. Huh, strange. Sound very briefly and it completely cut out. Also, no picture whatsoever. And I don't hear the high voltage oscillator running. So, still got some work to do for sure. Where do we hit sound briefly though? Could be uh Oh, could be a, a leaky capacitor. I still have a few that I haven't replaced. Uh, could be as a resistor warms up. Failing, or it could certainly be a bad tube. Uh, that's where I want to start out. I have not actually tested any of these tubes yet. But let's turn it back on briefly. See if we hear that sound again. And there it goes. Yeah, it's promising. 
You know, the tuner is more or less working, the IF and the audio stuff is more or less working. It's just as something heats up, warms up, it's crapping it out. So, I'm going to test all the tubes. Okay, let's take a closer look at these tubes. I see that there are numbers stamped on the chassis for the tubes, like this says 6AU6. Some are printed. There's another 6AU6. In some cases, there are multiple numbers, like this says 6S4 or 6W6. And I notice that the socket is a little bit odd looking. A 6W6 is an octal tube, I believe, so I guess this was like a, a factory option, depending on what tubes they had available. They could either go with a 9-pin base or an octal base. I notice in the tuner here, we have a whole bunch of tubes listed. Let's see. 6 BC5, 6 AG5, 6 CB6. What have I actually got? It's, it, it is a 6 AG5. And this should be a 6J6. Yep. Let's see. It should be a 6A6. Yep. 6A6. And this is actually printed 6AG5 on the socket, and that is indeed a 6AG5, but that's not what we've got on the schematic here. Or maybe it is, okay. Odd. 6AU6, 6AU6, 6AG5, and 6AU6, 6AU6. Right. 6AG5 and 6AU6 are fairly similar, but seems a little odd to use both in one set. And this looks like it's penciled in here, 12 AU7. But, I've got a 12 AV7, so I'm going to be replacing this with a 12 AU7. That's the uh, sink separator and clipper there. 6AC7 video output tube. I'm going to bring all these tubes over to my Hickok tube tester. 6S4. What I don't see anywhere is the 6AV6 sound amp tube. It's hiding somewhere. Horizontal output tube, horizontal oscillator, and then on the other side. Oh, maybe this is it. Yeah, it looks like a 6AV6. And here's the 6V6 audio output tube. Telesave. I've <laughs> never seen this brand before. Looks like a fairly cheap generic tube. And this should be a 6W4 damper tube. But we've actually got a 6AX4, which is fine. A 6AX4 is actually superior. I think it draws a little bit more filament current, but usually a beefy transformer like this can handle it. It does have better characteristics than a 6W4 though, so no problems there. What else have we got? 6SN7. Here's an output tube. It's a 6DQ6, I think. Or 6BQ6, rather. Yeah, there's more tube down in here. Kind of hard to get at. I think it's another 6SN7. Dumont brand. Ah, uh, yeah, 6SN7 GTV. And I believe there is a high voltage rectifier hiding inside here somewhere. Pop this top off to get it out.
All right, let's start out with the 6SN7. Here's one of three cards that you use to test it. They have three cards for this tube because it can be used in three different modes of operation. Here's one of them. Do line test. There we go. If there are any shorts, these lights will light up. And if this needle goes up, that means we've got some secondary emission. That's why I like this tester. It'll check for leakage. So on that top scale, uh, if it moves into the red, that means you've got leakage or secondary emission. That happens after a tube's been used hard for a long time. I believe what happens is conductive material actually gets transferred from the cathode to uh, the control grid or the screen. Alright, so... No gas. Quality. One section, very strong. Check the other section. Wow. It's one of the best success on sevens I've ever checked. I should have left that card in. I was thinking I would do go through the cards for uh, the two and three modes, but it's tested so well with the first card. I'm not gonna bother. Uh, here's the other one. The Dumont. No shorts, no secondary emission, no gas. Fine. Alright, good. I'm glad these are good because they're a little pricey to replace. Now let's go on to. Oh, let's check the 606. One of those six SN7s is a horizontal oscillator, and we don't have any high voltage, so I thought maybe that tube might be bad, but nope. Where is the card? 46V6. Sometimes these cards can be a little tricky to get in there. I got lucky with this tester in that the set of cards I got really covers well all the tubes from the late 40s into the early 50s that you find on TV. This one's got some secondary emission. In fact, it's almost getting up towards the red region. No shorts though. So this tube's a bit worn out. It's got a bit of secondary emission or leakage, and the quality isn't great. But still has some life left. Now we do the six AC seven now. Yeah. 
Oh, then we got a little bit of short going on there. Don't know if you guys can see that. The K light down there is flashing a little bit. Probably see it better if I turn the camera light off. So, I know I've got a whole bunch of 6AC7s on hand. I ordered up a bunch off of eBay because uh, I have a G. E, uh, 802 I want to restore and it uses like five or six of them so there was a guy selling like 25 a whole shoe box full and I bought all of them that's for the heck of it I'll check the quality wow <laughs> how's that for a bad tube now we have no high voltage but if we had we wouldn't have had a picture anyways because this tube is completely dead so I would expect that short there, that's the cathode, it's probably shorting out to uh, one of the other elements that's preventing any emission from getting out. Right, now I will move on to all the 6AU6s and if I find any more bad tubes I'll record some more video. I think I may have found the problem with the sound. It's a 6AV6 tube that drives a 6V6 output tube. Nope. Oh. Check this out. Short on the plate, short on the suppressor. So, that tube is definitely bad. I just went up in the attic and went rummaging through my tubes and got a whole bunch. Got some 6AC7s some 6AV6s and so on. Still have a few more tubes to test, but uh, I'm sure I've got replacements for any more that might be bad. And I'm going to double check these replacements. Since i got my tester out and I know i got some bad tubes, definitely don't want to put in <laughs> some uh, replacements that might be suspect, because most of my replacement tubes are poles. I tested some of them, but doesn't hurt to recheck. Ooh, <laughs> don't like that. Yeah, that secondary emission shot up immediately. Quality's okay though, but I don't like all that secondary leakage. more. 6AV6 is pretty common too. Let's see. Yeah, that one. Most of my tubes are either poles from other sets or I got a whole bunch from an old TV radio repair shop and I, they weren't boxed so I presume they were also used. I do have a few new old stock ones, though, but I just didn't happen to find any 6AV6s. Alright, this one's looking more promising. No shorts, no secondary emission. Alright, nice and strong. Because I should have checked the gas, too. Yeah, no gas. I don't think I've ever actually found a tube that was gassy, other than ones that had completely lost their vacuum and the getter had gone all white. But it doesn't hurt to check. Alright, both sections of this tube test really good, so definitely go with this 6AV6. I just found yet another bad tube. It's one of the 6AU6s used in the IF stages. The cathode short light is feebly flickering. And we've got a ton of leakage well into the replace range. I bet it still functions somewhat in the set though. But I'm sure the circuit was not performing as well as it should. So, let's test one of my boxed used tubes. I'm getting anxious to pop all these new tubes in the set and see what kind of difference it makes.
Much better. I was curious to see how that 6AU6 with the high leakage would test in my triplet 3413B emission only type tester. It doesn't really have a test for leakage, but it does have a test for shorts. So I popped the tube in there, got it all set up for a 6AU6. And if I check the value, it actually measures well into the good. And if that's the only test you did, you would think this tube was fine. To test for shorts, you flip all the levers that are not in bold. So one, two, five, six, seven. And if there's a short, that light should come on. So looks okay, okay. Oh, and that's supposed to do four because that's in bold. Five, six, seven. Ah, happy to see that on seven, that light does come on. So that goes to show that even a basic emission type tester can still identify this tube as being bad. What do you know, yet another bad tube. This time it's the 6S4 vertical output tube. That's what drives the yoke to make the electron beam go up and down. Quality check, not so hot. I just went rummaging through my tubes, and this time I got a new old stock one. I've got a number of GE tubes like this that have the letters I and D on them. I'm not sure what that means. It could be industrial. So these might be a higher grade of tube or a rugged version of it. Not sure. As before, even though it's new old stock, I will definitely test it so we can get out of the box <laughs> there we go turns out it's actually an RCA so somebody reused that box and this may actually be a used tube let's see how it tests No shorts, no leakage, no gas. Eh, <laughs> not great, although it's still slowly climbing. Better than the other two, but not great, so I think I'll go hunting for another one. Okay, I've reinstalled all the tubes, so time for another test. Alright, that's done. Let's see if it lasts more than a couple seconds. I think we're in business. However, no picture. So brightness control is having no effect. I think this is contrast. Also no effect. So, let's see if we actually have any high voltage. I don't hear any high voltage or high, high pitch squeal. But it uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's not working. So, got my Pomona high voltage probe here. Oh, yeah, we got high voltage. Over 12,000 volts. So, that's good. So, why no picture? Well, I actually think I know what the problem is. Give you guys a few seconds to look over the set. See if you can figure out what the problem might be. In particular, look at the neck of the picture tube. 
There's something missing. There's a 17 BP4 pitcher tube. If we look it up here in this TV service manual, I got data for all the common pitcher tubes. So some orders. Here is the 17 BP4B. You know, this data go along here. Do, 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 do. You get to this column ion trap magnet. It's got an S there. It means it's a single pole ion trap magnet. Well, it's missing. <laughs> this is how the set was delivered to me. I have no idea where it might have gone, but it's not there. To have a spare lying here, so pop it on. Kind of a drag that I don't have the original because uh, I'm not sure how it should be oriented. But uh, I guess we'll try it both ways and see which works better. I got a whole bag of these. I got it at uh, Antique Radio Fair a couple years ago. So, dig through those and see which one will work best. Because this actually goes on another set, and I keep it with that set. Right, it's snug, but it's loose enough that I can maneuver it around because I'm going to have to uh, find a sweet spot. Here we go. This should be the first picture we get out of this set. rotating and moving it back and forth. Turn the focus control on. <laughs> I was hoping for something a little bit better than that. Let's brighten this. This is vertical hold, I think. I'm gonna try flipping this magnet around. Now, let's see if this works any better. Alright, well clearly I <laughs> still got some more work to do, but uh, it's progress.
I just installed a different ion trap magnet before I was using this guy. Now I've got this one, which is a spring and a little magnet. These magnets do get weaker over time, and I imagine there are different strengths for different uh, types of pitcher tubes. So, let's see if this works any better. All right. Give this a try. Well, there's a little something. It's looking promising already. Or more promising, I should say. Try adjusting this. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I figured this pitcher tube would be really bright because it tested so well. Wow. Easily the brightest black and white set that I've restored so far. Let's see if we can get this picture to synchronize here. Let's focus. Alright, so I can get a vertical lock, but not horizontal. Some controls in the back of the set. Let's see what's back there. Well, one of them is height. Yeah, that's height. Um, it's vertical linearity and the rest are little slugs I'll have to get a little plastic alignment tool to manipulate them okay I found a slug on the back for horizontal width horizontal linearity horizontal drive and horizontal lock I'm guessing if I adjust that horizontal lock we could get this to synchronize It's definitely having an effect. All right. I'm manipulating the controls in the front here. It's contrast, brightness, little gold, horizontal hole, and focus. And here's fine tuning. Alright, I'm going to uh, 
hook up a real uh, video source so we'll see something a little more interesting. Here's an episode of The Outer Limits. Pretty darn good picture. I still want to go through and tweak it a little bit though. This set actually uses what I believe is the same tuner as the last Admiral set I worked on, the uh, 20X11. Even though the set's uh, about three years newer. Anyway, I need to get a test pattern on there, tweak the linearity and so on, but otherwise, looking quite well. I've had this set playing for a while, and in general, everything's fine, but a few minor issues. For example, here I've tuned it to a dead station, so no signal coming in, and we see some faint vertical stripes on the left-hand side. Could be several reasons for that. Um, for example, the damper tube. This set was originally designed for a 6W4 and I found a 6AX4 tube installed. In general that's a fine substitute but it's certainly worth swapping in a 6W4 to see if that remedies the problem. There's also a horizontal drive control on the back which controls how much power goes through to the horizontal output tube which in addition to the flyback also drives the horizontal yoke windings. So I can try adjusting that. Uh, there's also a capacitor inside of the yoke housing that goes across one of the horizontal yoke windings, which could be defective. So hopefully we can reduce these. Another issue you might have caught earlier on is that occasionally you hear some weird feedback, kind of howling. Yeah, I can simulate that or get it to happen again by manipulating the controls a little bit. like that. It seems to mostly come into play when I t touch the fine-tuning or the volume control or even just tap the chassis. It could be something called microphonics going on in the 6J6 oscillator mixer tube or there could be some weird feedback in the audio circuit. I'm not sure. It doesn't seem to affect the picture, just the sound. Also hooked up my B and K 1077B television analyst. Let's see what channel do I have it on? Channel two. Oh yeah. In general, not bad, especially the horizontal. Looks like the linearity is pretty good. We've also got pretty good bandwidth. Uh, see these numbers here. Those indicate the bandwidth. The idea is if you can still distinguish the stripes, you've got good bandwidth. And I can still see stripes at 3.5, even kind of at 4, which is just fine. Or down here they show you the number of lines of resolution. 150, 200, 250, 325. When I use my B and K, I've also got to take a, into consideration the fact that I have not overhauled it yet. So I don't know really, uh, it's, it's not exactly perfect itself, but it produces a decent enough test pattern for this kind of stuff. Vertical height and linearity are off just a tad, so I'll tweak those, but otherwise I think those type of adjustments are pretty good. So I really I just want to figure out or try to reduce these stripes and get rid of that weird feedback that I hear creeping in occasionally. <laughs> 